Weekend meetings at Camp David. All this is President Trump's former chief strategist, Steve Bannon, tries to make amends publicly as we say good morning. Hope you stayed warm over the weekend. I'm Talk Bill Hammer. <laughs> yes, it was. Welcome to America's News. Good morning, Sandra. Good morning to you, Bill. I'm Sandra Smith. Bannon now expressing regret over quotes attributed to him in the White House tell all book, Fire and Fury, where he called a meeting between Donald Trump Jr. and Russian operatives, quote, treasonous. Senior White House advisor Stephen Miller dismissing Bannon and his comments. Listen. It's tragic and unfortunate that Steve would make these grotesque comments so out of touch with reality and obviously so vindictive. And it reads like an angry, vindictive person spouting off to a highly discreditable author. We have Fox team coverage for you on this Monday morning. Former Trump deputy campaign manager David Bossy is standing by. But we begin with Chief White House correspondent John Roberts. Good morning, John. Sandra, good morning to you. Not exactly an apology from the president's former chief strategist, Steve Bannon, about comments he allegedly made to author Michael Wolf in Wolf's new book. Uh, more of a clarification of what Bannon meant and where Bannon stands. Bannon, in statements to Fox News yesterday, saying that he fully supports the president and his agenda about his comments that the meeting Donald Trump Jr. had with that Russian attorney as being treasonous. Bannon said in a statement that the reporting was inaccurate, adding, quote, Donald Trump Jr. is both a patriot and a good man. He has been relentless in his advocacy for his father and the agenda that helped turn our country around. Bannon said that his comments about the meeting and other things came from his life experiences in the Navy and at the Pentagon battling the Soviet Union and that Donald Trump Jr. wasn't actually the target of his comments in a statement to Fox News saying, quote, my comments were aimed at Paul Manafort, a seasoned campaign professional with experience and knowledge of how the Russians operate. He should have known they are duplicitous, cunning, and not our friends. To reiterate, those comments were not aimed at Don Jr. The president also pushing back against allegations in the book that he is unfit for the office, not mentally stable enough to do it uh, over the weekend, quote, unquote, or over the weekend tweeting, rather, actually throughout my life, my two greatest assets have been mental stability and being, like, really smart. I went from a very successful businessman to top TV star to president of the United States on my first try. I think that would qualify as not smart, but genius, and a very stable genius at that. Members of the administration taken to the Sunday morning shows yesterday to defend the president. Here's the head of the CIA, Mike Pompeo. Those statements are just absurd, Chris. I mean, just, just pure fantasy. The president is engaged. He, he understands the complexity. He asks really difficult questions of our team at CIA so that we can provide him the information that he needs to make good informed policy decisions. Statements like the one Mr. Wolf made about uh, how, how we all think about the president, just, they're just ridiculous on their face. What remains to be seen, though, Sander, is whether Steve Bannon has irreparably damaged his relationship with the president or whether that mea culpa that he issued yesterday may thaw the ice enough that he can get back some of the influence that many people believe he has lost in terms of trying to put forward candidates for the 2018 midterm elections. Sandra? So, John, clearly a big weekend for the president. What is on the president's schedule today? He, uh, he leaves the White House about 1 o'clock this afternoon. He's bound for Nashville, Tennessee, uh, where the weather has been fairly bad there this morning as the weather moves eastward. He is going to be the first sitting president in 25 years to address the National Farm Bureau Federation annual convention. And then from there, he jets off to Atlanta, Georgia, where he's going to watch the Georgia Bulldogs pull off an upset victory over the Alabama Crimson Tide. You heard it here first. Oh. <laughs> like everything, John Roberts. Thank you very much. Sandra and I have a bit of a wager on that. We shall share in 30 minutes. For more, now, I want to bring in the co author of Let Trump Be Trump, David Bossy, former deputy campaign manager, president of Citizens United, Fox's contributor. David, good morning to you. I always thought good. you were the genius, by the way. <laughs> I'm far from that, but I do know that Alabama is going to win tonight. That's oh, what okay. I do. Well, hang on. <laughs> ha hang on 30 minutes on that. Listen, um, Steve Bannon put out a statement with Axios over the weekend. This is part of what he said on screen. Everything I have to say about the ridiculous nature of the Russian collusion investigation, I said on my 60 Minutes interview, there was no collusion. The investigation is a witch hunt. He continued, I regret that my delay in responding to the inaccurate reporting regarding Don Jr. has diverted attention for the president's historical accomplishments in the first year of his presidency, end quote. What do you make of this now, David? Well, I'm with, uh, you know, the members of the administration like Mon Mike Pompeo who just find this book to be pure fiction. It is outrageous on its face. Uh, first of all, I've read uh, about half the book and it's uh, quite boring to be 
candid with you, as somebody who lived uh, through that campaign and the transition, uh, it, it's just not very well done. There's some salaciousness to it. That's what's got the attention, but it's just not a very well written right. book. I read it over the weekend as well. Did not finish it, but I read a good part of it. In the first 50 pages, he repeatedly makes the case that no one at Trump Tower thought they could win. That's just. Did, did, did you ever speak? <laughs> uh, did you ever speak with Michael Wolff? First of all, uh, I, I actually I did probably in about uh, June of, of this year. So about you know or last year, about six or seven months ago, uh, I sat down with him for probably about forty minutes, uh, and it, it was a, did, a did waste someone, of my time. Did someone tell you to sit down with him, or how did that come about? Yeah, it, it was, uh, and I, I I sat down with him. I, I had really not been interested in sitting down with anybody about any book, uh, mostly because uh, Corey Lewandowski and I were writing our own. So I found very little value okay. in wanting to sit with him. Uh, and, uh, and look, what, he's turn, what he has turned out, yeah. what he has turned out, this book, is, is just, it's the National Enquirer on steroids, and that's all I consider it. And, and I, I just find it to not be a very insightful book. I find it to be just full of lies. Look, it, let me just go to one example. On election night, he says that Melania Trump and was, uh, was, was uh, crying in tears. Uh, it, it's the furthest thing from the truth. I, stat, I stood very close, very near Melania Trump most of the evening. Uh, if the furthest thing from the truth. The entire family was ecstatic. And by the way, in the week leading up to the election, another thing that we talk about in our book as a first-hand account was how the polling data, how our intelligence had showed us and our campaign closing that gap, closing down uh, those polling numbers in those battleground states that we ended up winning on election night. We Look, anything I can happen on election day, David, but we I thought we were going to so win. Our audience knows the Friday before the election, you came to the Fox News Center, uh, the Fox News Channel here in New York, and you went to all the other networks as well. And you made that very case. And that, that did not appear in the book. I don't, I don't know why. But back to the question. Who well, it, it, it actually... Who told, who told if you? If I could, if I could just build for one second, you I, 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 I outline in my book uh, my little debate with Chris Dyerwalt about North Carolina I specifically. That. Yeah, that was your book. <laughs> We're talking about Wolf's book. Who no, no, told that's right. you to sit down and talk to Michael Wolf? Well, actually, it was it was it was uh, Steve uh, and, and and I had a conversation about it, and he asked me to sit down with him. Okay, your office in Trump Tower was right next to Steve Bannon. That's Why would Steve Bannon bring in such a, um, an outsider, let's say, um, to write Well, this? you know what? I haven't talked to Steve about that, and I don't know why he would uh, have allowed this guy. But uh, let me just say this. I know Steve Bannon has uh, started his explanation, and I think there's, some, there's still a ways to go in it. However, there are other people who, are, you know, who spoke to this person uh, you know, within the White House, within the administration, and they have some explaining to do as well. Um, I would guess, after seeing the book, that if you don't like this president, you're going to love the book. That's right. And, and if you like President but, Trump, you're going you're gonna to hate the book. Last comment on that, I've got another thing for you. So. you no, know, and that's what Michael Wolff did. He wrote a book to fit the narrative that he wanted. Right in the prologue of his book, uh, of the, this book of, of, of fiction and lies, he says right in the first pages that this is my version of the truth. He doesn't say this is the truth. This is my version of the truth. That's his words. And so you can discount most of what is in it. Okay. Uh, I want to ask you about Camp David in a moment. But th this Newsweek headline from over the weekend caught my eye. Here's what it says. Trump could destroy the entire human species, says Yale psychiatrists who warn Congress members. Now, you're hearing a lot about mental stability on behalf of the commander in chief. Where is it coming from and what do you have to add on this? Well, first of all, this is a, this is a grotesque attack from the left and from the mainstream media who only want to try to delegitimize this president's incredible uh, defeat of crooked Hillary and his 304 electoral votes. That, that's all this is, is another layer because of this the, 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 the issue of the Russia so-called collusion has just been completely dismantled by this president. There is, there it was none, there is none, uh, as far as any of us are concerned, uh, of a co coordination with, with Russia over our election and our victory. Uh, oh. President Trump won uh, his election all by himself. 
And 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 so this is this is just more of that ridiculous okay. uh, uh, <clears throat> aspect of what the left. Let, will let me stop just jump in here, David. Just want to get two more topics. Camp David yeah, over the course. weekend. You fund the government. You got to get that done over the next two weeks. Less than that, actually. Do, do you think there are enough Democrats to get on board an immigration bill? Yes or no? Well, I, I certainly hope so. This president has put forward, you know, a bipartisan approach to infrastructure and to immigration and to other issues. He, he wants to do things with the Democrats. It's Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, who have been the wall, if you will, against any making any movement on any of these important issues for the American people. OK, last thing here. Chris Christie and exit interview said the following. It's incredibly frustrating to think to yourself, wow, if this guy were not in the race, we'd win this thing. And I absolutely believe believe if Trump had not gotten to the race, I think we would have won. What do you make of that, David? Well, we did win. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little, con I don't know what that's referring to. We, he, Donald Trump did win the race. I didn't catch the last part there, buddy. Sorry. So, so Bill, I don't understand what Chris is actually talking about. Is, is that referring to the presidential race? Yes. Well, but, but, Donald Trump is president of the United States, Bill. Yeah. I don't, I'm sorry. I don't understand what well, Governor he, Christie, who's a he, great he man and a good if friend. Donald Trump wasn't in his way, he'd be the president. Oh, I think that's Chris the Christie would have won. Correct. Ah, I apologize. That's my error. But that's, that's okay. Th look, I think Governor Christie would have been a very formidable candidate against the rest of the field. He would have been the anti, he would have been the anti establishment candidate, the, the, the truth talker, if you will. So I think he would have been. It would have come down to him and, I think and, and Ted it's, Cruz. It's and a others. very interesting topic for political junkies. David, thank you very it much. Is. We'll see if your prediction comes true later tonight. You say, <laughs> you say Alabama. We roll shall, tide roll. We shall share soon. Thank you, sir, very much for being with us in D.C. And I mean, we, we've had this thing going for a month here, okay? So in 30 minutes, we'll reveal the... Uh, Battle royale. The conversations during the commercial breaks between Smith and Hemmer of what you <laughs> need to know tonight for the national championship. We will bring that to you, of course. Meanwhile, we've got some breaking news this morning fire at Trump Tower. We are hearing there have been two injuries after flames are seen pouring out of the roof of Trump Tower in New York City. We're live at the scene. Also, there was a manhunt underway after a police officer shot and killed trying to stop a home invasion. What happened there? Details coming up in a moment. And a major meeting set to unfold between North and South Korea. While here at home, the Trump administration makes it clear that the U.S. will not tolerate a nuclear Pyongyang. General Jack Keane is here to weigh in. He knows I'm not messing around. I'm not messing around. Not even a little bit. Not even 1%. If something can happen and something can come out of those talks, that would be a great thing for all of humanity. That would be a great thing for the world. North and South Korea holding talks first time in two years tomorrow, Tuesday. This coming as the Trump team says the U.S. policy on North Korea has not changed after President Trump suggested he be willing to talk to the dictator Kim Jong-un over the weekend. Nikki Haley said this on ABC. There is no turnaround. What he has basically said is, yes, there could be a time where we talk to North Korea, but a lot of things have to happen before that actually takes place. They have to stop testing. They have to be willing to talk about banning their nuclear weapons. Those things have to happen. Well, retired Force Star General Jack Keane, chairman for the Institute of Study of War, Fox News strategic analyst. Sir, how are you? And good morning, General. Good morning, Bill. Good to see you doing better. Uh, thank you, sir, very much for that. Does tomorrow matter much on the Korea matter? Well, I think we have to see. I mean, this is clearly North Korea's initiative. Um, and I think, as our audience may know, uh, they have used negotiations in the past, you know, really to buy time for their own technological development. In fact, we were in negotiations with them in 2005 when they actually finalized the development of a nuclear weapon. So there's a history here. But I also think there's some other things that are happening, Bill, is that the, the international community has, has pretty much shut down most of the trade with North Korea, likely some backdoor stuff going on, to be sure. But that's never happened before. So they're feeling uh, an economic squeeze that they've never felt before. Gas stations are closing, long lines at some other ones, malnutrition, starvation, uh, impact on the population. So wow, that's, that's there's, January, some, there's some pressure that's here. That's January, too. Keep going, General. So I, I think 
that, that likely this negotiation may be as a result of the Trump administration's maximum pressure policy more than to advance their technology. They, so we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll just see where this thing goes. A couple points you make that I think are critical. You can develop the technology faster, you argue, than you can put sanctions in place. True? Well, I only, I'm only saying that because I'm listening to what the director of the CIA, uh, Pompeo, said months ago and what he said yesterday on Fox. And that is that, look, it, we're only months away from North Korea finalizing their technology development. And by that, he means miniaturizing a nuclear weapon on top of an ICBM capable of reaching the United States successfully through reentry from space. That he believes we're just months away from that. Well, economic sanctions, as we all know, haven't seen them in other countries as well. It takes it takes longer for those things to have impact. So uh -huh. we're kind of in a race here, but we're coming to a showdown for uh, sure. Th that's what they call full capability. Mike Pompeo, you mentioned him with Chris Wallace on Sunday, described it this way. The North yeah. Koreans are behaving out of fear. That is, they are very concerned that America, for the first time in an awfully long time, is serious about need denuclearizing, denuclearizing the peninsula. And I think they're finding, trying to find a foothold, trying to find a place to reach out. And we'll, we'll just have to wait and see how the conversation is going. I think it was a very interesting conversation there with Chris Wallace. General Mattis meets with the president tomorrow at the White House. In addition, North Korea believes the United States wants to change their leadership, regime change. Internally in that country, that's what they fear the most. Would you agree with that point? Yeah, you know, it, it, they've actually changed their position a little bit. The grandfather and the father believed that pointing nuclear weapons at South Korea would guarantee no regime change. But after, after they watched, the Kim dynasty watched U.S. behavior in the Middle East, Iraq regime change, Afghanistan regime change, Libya regime change, particularly after Gaddafi in Libya gave up his WMD, their policy shifted. Kim Jong-un then said holding North, uh, South Korea hostage to nuclear weapons isn't enough. We have to hold the American people hostage like Russia and China does. That's when he changed his program. So at, at his, his backup is, I mean, his, his stand down position is no regime change in North Korea. That's, that is inviolate as far as he's concerned. Can we have some impact on that? Can we convince him that we're not going to do regime change? We've said it. We've used rhetoric. Is there another way that we convince him? Possibly through negotiations, we could get there. I think that's what's in the back of the, the president's mind. Yeah. High level stuff. General, thank you so much. Jack yeah, Keen, good talking to you, Bill. You're a smart man. Thank you, sir. We'll see you real soon. Thanks, Sandra. Another big story today President Trump gearing up for a trip to Nashville, Tennessee, where he will be addressing America's farmers and how he plans to turn the struggling agricultural industry around. We will have a preview with Mr. Charles Payne on set with us, plus Oprah Winfrey stealing the show at last night's Golden Globes. Why Hollywood? Is all a buzz about a possible presidential run? I told some jokes about our current president at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, jokes about how he was unqualified to be president, and some have said that night convinced him to run. So if that's true, I just want to say, Oprah, you will never be president. The sheriff's deputy now has died after being shot while responding to a home invasion. Happened Pierce County, south of Tacoma, Washington. Officials saying one suspect fired several rounds of the officer as he fled the scene. And that officer, whose name has not been released, was a three-year veteran of the force with three young children at home. This is another reminder that our people go out, they put themselves at risk for everybody else, and too often... They are harmed in the process. Police say the suspect, considered armed and dangerous, uh, a second suspect was found dead at the scene there. In President Trump heading to Nashville, Tennessee today. He's expected to address American farmers and lay out an economic roadmap for improving the agricultural industry in this country. Those plans reportedly include boosting technology and innovation within rural America. Joining me now is Charles Payne, host of Making Money with Charles Payne on FBN. We're glad you're here this morning. Good morning. So this is a very interesting move by this president. The first time in 26 years that a sitting president has accepted the invitation to speak to this convention why do you think he's doing this? This is uh, this is towards President Trump, right? About the forgotten man, a 
woman in middle America. This is why he was propelled to the White House. Uh, you know, and, and you think about the challenges in rural America, population decline, wages are lagging significantly, educational crisis, you've got access to capital, so how do you revive it? You've got the opioid crisis, you've got a uh, health crisis, uh, and, and the elites have more or less ignored this, and, and, and it's, it's great to see President Trump addressing it, not just going to speak, uh, but also with some of these actions, I think, that they, they've got planning and like to get through. Let's talk about some of the challenges that our America's farmers face today. I mean, the agricultural industry, as you know, something I'm extremely familiar with. I grew up on the commodity trading floors in Chicago. I mean, you look at the corn, soybean, and, and those agricultural markets, the price Prices have been depressed. Uh, there's an oversupply on the market. What is the president going to say that he can do to help them out? Uh, access to capital is going to be very critical, right? So one good thing I will say before I start at all is for the second time in 100 years, we actually saw an increase in 35 and under farmers. So farming is, might be cool again, and I think that's because people, younger people like organic food, they're into food, they're into the food channel, those kind of things. So that's important. Now you want to get them back on the farm, give them access to capital so they can actually start their farm, do some of the things like lower regulations and all the other things. That healthcare is a big healthcare problem is a for huge them as well. Wow. huge problem for them as well, just like any small business. So because the majority of these are small businesses. So do those things that revive small business, that make it more attractive to people who, by the way, are starting to be more attracted to the farming industry to begin with. Also, President Trump is going to have to grapple with the rhetoric with respect to, for instance, China. I mean, we export so many goods to China on the farm side, agricultural side, including soybeans. It's billions of dollars. So uh, he's got some challenges, but I, the idea that he's there, he's ready to face them, I think is, is I'm optimistic optimistic about it because I already see some changes. I see farm wealth there. The estate tax thing is going to help uh, when you transfer farm ownership from one family, you know, from a family member and things. So there, all the pieces are starting to get put in place. But to your point, it's been neglected for a long and time. And we want the best for America's farmers, that's for sure. But then when you look specifically at rural America, I know also on the agenda is talk about uh, expanding access to high-speed internet. This right. has been one of the biggest challenges uh, for seeing growth in rural America. You need high-speed internet, but let's not forget old-fashioned infrastructure. Uh, the, the Senate did a report earlier this year. They want to widen lanes and repair those highways. They want to repair the bridges. They want to conserve nat natural habitats for hunters and farmers. Uh, and they also need public transportation. Uh, you know, it's hard to even get to the nearest store. So there are some challenges. And by the way, that's an area where government really can come into play. You know, you got areas for business. In the new tax bill that was just passed, our new tax law, Tim Scott was a champion of a piece, of, a critical piece in there that will help urban areas but also rural areas, economically depressed, attract businesses with massive tax incentives. I can't wait to hear what he has to say this morning. And I also liked this quote from the Nebraska Farmers Union president this morning. John Hansen said, first and foremost, we need a president who knows and understands just how much financial trouble production agriculture is in. So he's likely to address a lot of those challenges Absolutely. and concerns this morning. Charles Bain, Thank always you. good to Happy see you. New Year, we'll see you tonight as well. Thank Bring you. The pain. President Trump, meanwhile, saying he wants to work with Democrats and immigration reform, Democrats rather on immigration reform. Can they bridge the divide over the border wall and dreamers here in the U.S.? The legislative director, Mark Short, spent the weekend at Camp David working on all this and a lot more, so he will answer that. Coming up next, live. Look, if we don't deal with the security and with chain migration, we will be back before us on a DACA issue in a few years. And that's the wrong thing for America to do. 933 here in New York had some breaking news this morning. We're going to get to that right now. A small fire breaking out on the top floor of the Trump Tower in Midtown Manhattan, about 120 firefighters responding there. Uh, and that is where our senior correspondent, Eric Sean, is. Fifth Avenue and 56th Street. Eric, what's happening now? Uh, good morning, Bill. Well, it was quite a scare this morning. The alarm came in uh, in the FDNY dispatch system reading fire in multiple dwelling, parentheses, Trump Tower. And it was quite a scene when you looked at the top of the roof of this gleaming glass and chrome building. Smoke, white smoke, a lot of it billowing from the roof. The fire actually broke out in the roof system of the HVAC in a cooling tower. It did not break out at all inside the building itself. It took about an hour for the uh, New York's bravest to tamp the fire down. There were two minor injuries, they say, a firefighter who had some debris fall on him and a building engineer, but it was quite a scene. 70 firefighters responded, an emergency command center set up in the frigid 16-degree weather. 
and the uh, New York firefighters, as they always do, they responded. Whether you're at the home of the president or a regular person like us, they did respond to this blaze quickly. The Secret Service that were monitoring the building noticed the uh, smoke coming from the roof, and they called the fire safety director in the lobby, and by checking the cameras throughout the building, he did say we had flames coming out of a vent on the top of the building. Well, Eric Trump tweeted this, quote, there was a small electrical fire in the cooling tower of Trump Tower. The New York Fire Department was here within minutes and did an incredible job. The men and women of the FDNY are true heroes and deserve our most sincere thanks and praise. Trump Tower, of course, is the crown jewel of the uh, president's real estate empire. It was a second major project here in New York. The first was taking over the old Commodore Hotel and making that the Grand Hyatt. He does live on the, uh, on the top of three floors, penthouse. The concern, though, is there could be some water damage. So, Mr. President, if you're watching, it's fine, but maybe you should call your insurance company. Well, That's <laughs> it from Trump Tower. Back to yeah, you. Water's going to freeze. Thank you, Eric Sean there on Fifth Avenue. Thanks. Meanwhile, another big story today, President Trump doubling down on his desire for bipartisan cooperation with Democrats while at Camp David. But the president also insisting that any deal to protect dreamers must include funding for his border wall as well as uh, an end to so-called chain migration. We want the wall. The wall's going to happen or we're not going to have DACA. Uh, we want to get rid of chain migration. Very important. And we want to get rid of the lottery system. In addition to that, we want some money for funding. We need some additional border security. We all want DACA to happen, but we also want great security for our country. Joining me now is White House Director of Legislative Affairs, Mark Short, who spent the weekend at Camp, D Camp David. Mark, thanks for being here this morning. I know it was quite a weekend. Can you give us any details that came out of that meeting? Well, Sandra, it was a great weekend. It was a good opportunity for us to uh, make sure that uh, Speaker Ryan, Leader McConnell, the President are all on the same page about 2018 and what we have to do. We also though, spent time looking back at 2017 and recognizing that it really was an historic year to be able to accomplish what we were able to do on tax relief, what we were able to do on ANWR, what we were able to do with the regulatory relief. An historic year as far as uh, repealing the individual mandate and also confirming 12 circuit court judges and a United States Supreme Court judge. So, so based on think, all that, Mark, What's setting up to be the big legislative priority in the new year? I think there's a couple things. Uh, we're anxious to complete a budget cap deal so we can get a spending bill to rebuild our military. That is a priority. We face several national concerty concerns, and the president submitted a budget last February as to the resources that we need for 2018, and we plan to do so again this February for 2019. But because of the impasse in Congress, we've been unable to secure that funding to actually begin to rebuild the military. Secretary Mattis will be on the Hill again tomorrow making his case to Republicans and Democrats about the need for that. Unfortunately, the Democrat position has been to say we're not going to agree to any additional spending until there's a deal on DACA. And while we're anxious to get a deal on DACA, we feel it's improper to hold hostage our troops who are working so hard to protect us over a position on illegal immigration. Well, that deadline is quickly approaching, so that obviously has to be a priority. But from what we're hearing otherwise, immigration reform is a top priority. And while you're saying Democrats want DACA, we know that the president is adamant about wanting that border wall that he promised all along uh, through his campaign, through the election cycle. So, so how or what is the White House strategy to garner bipartisan support? Well, it's not just what the president, it is what the president campaigned on, but it's not simply that. We've had the Customs and Border Patrol give several presentations to the Hill to talk about, here's where we need the physical barrier and the security. It's, it, is, it is something that was used on the campaign, but it's more than that. It's where we're seeing drugs coming and flowing across the border. It's where we're seeing the biggest threat to our, to our border security, and there are places that are immediate priorities. And I think when they give that presentation, even Democrats acknowledge how much sense it makes, but the problem is that for political reasons, they're looking to put up no pun intended a wall to say we're not going to do that until and not even not even until they're simply saying that that's a position they don't want to give the president a victory on so you don't we're want to tie to get up, there. you don't want to tie DACA into funding the government um, so so is, does the deal involved DACA and the border wall is that what we're starting to see shape up I think the president has put forward that it needs to require border security. It also needs to require an end to chain migration, and it needs to eliminate the diversity lottery program. Those are three priorities for the administration. But Sandra, keep in mind that DACA has been something that has plagued uh, Congress for years. It's why President Obama took unilateral action, which we thought was unconstitutional, and the courts ruled it was such. 
We've been waiting for years for Congress to address this problem. The president, General Kelly, went up when he was DHS secretary to tell Congress we need to do this. The president put forward a plan in September and October and said, here are our principles. Mm. We're still waiting for Congress to give us a return. So the president wants DACA solved, too. He wants to protect these individuals, but we need a plan from Congress so we can make progress. Mark, as, as we continue to see the fallout from this book, Fire and Fury, this morning, uh, learning now that Steve Bannon is showing some regret for some of the comments he made along the way that have been published in that book, I, I'm sure there's got to be a level of frustration uh, for, for you uh, working on the legislative agenda, trying to get things done, trying to get the White House message out there, and this continues to dominate the headlines. You've been with the president since the very beginning. Uh, January 2017. Are any of the findings of this book that have been published consistent with your experience inside of the White House, such as uh, the president not understanding the weight of his office or um, the competen his competency being questioned by senior aides? Sandra, I have no intention of picking up the book or reading it. I think the reality is the president's doing a phenomenal job. I've read a couple of excerpts that have been published in other papers that talk about, you know, election night or the president not reading things. And all I know is that there, maybe, maybe people aren't providing good reading material to him because when I submit memos, he reads them thoroughly. He often puts markings on them, sends them back to me. So everything I've seen from this president shows he's incredibly engaged and he's doing a phenomenal job for the American people. All right, and the president has a big speech to rural America Day addressing farmers uh, of the United States. So I know you guys, you have a busy agenda to start out the week. So Mark Short, thanks for coming on with us this morning. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. A huge weekend in pro football, wild card weekend, wild indeed. New Orleans Saints holding off the Carolina Panthers at home. Great game there. Jacksonville won a defensive battle against the Buffalo Bills. Where are the highlights, you ask? I don't know. We're looking for them. <laughs> On Saturday, Tennessee against uh, Kansas City. Marcus Mariota actually, Mariota actually threw a touchdown pass that he caught for a touchdown. Second time NFL history has ever happened, right? Leading his team one point win over Kansas City on the road. Atlanta Falcons beat the LA Rams on the road. They advance to Minneapolis next week. You got all that? The NFL rolls on. But tonight is the night for college football freaks. <laughs> you have to be a freak? Oh, Can no. you look forward to that? I'm a freak about football <laughs> okay. for sure. National Championship, Atlanta, Georgia. The Georgia Bulldogs rolling in oh, against the Alabama boy. Crimson Tide. Oh, boy. And uh, that's going to be a big old big one. You know my sensitivity so, to Nick Saban. Oh, right, uh, being, being an LSU tie, you're right. So about a month ago, Sandra and I said, Sandra said, so Hemmer, who's going to win the national championship? And I said, I will take Alabama and I'll give you the rest of the field for a dollar. So you know who I've got. So I will stand by that. <laughs> yeah. I, I'll take Alabama and I will give you Georgia. Deal? Uh, the bet is on, sir. Right on. Can't wait now. Tonight. No, we set it up. All right. Breaking news this morning coming in out of Houston where a missing reporter has been found. Whoa. Details on how Courtney Rowland... Is wow, now doing. That, is, that is good news there. Also, growing fallout over Michael Wolf's anti-Trump book. The Trump administration calls it garbage. The White House says the media coverage has gone off the rails. Our panel reacts to all that coming up next right here. The whole White House staff is deeply disappointed in his comments, which were grotesque. His role has been greatly exaggerated, whereas the president hasn't gotten the due that he deserves for the movement that he put together to tap into the kinds of people whose life concerns don't get a lot of attention on CNN. This is a Fox News alert and an update to a breaking story we've been following all morning long. A Texas A&M University reporter who had been missing since Sunday afternoon has been found safe. She had apparently texted a friend that someone was following her inside the Galleria Mall in Houston. Houston police tweeting that Courtney Rowland was found unharmed at an area near the mall. She has been taken to an area hospital for evaluation. Your network's been going 24-7 with all this salacious coverage, and I know that it brings a lot of you guys a lot of joy to trying to stick the knife in. But the reality is, is that page after page after page of the book is pure false. 24 hours of negative anti-Trump hysterical coverage on this network okay. that led in recent weeks to some spectacularly think, embarrassing false reporting from your network. I think the viewers right now can ascertain no, who's the being viewers hysterical. Are
And this was, this was uh, something else. White House Senior Advisor uh, Stephen Miller slam an interview there with CNN yesterday and Jake Tapper, accusing that network of playing up sordid allegations in Michael Wolff's new book, Fire and Fury. President Trump tweeting this, I've had to put up with the fake news, and from the first day I noticed that I would be running for president. Now I have to put up with a fake book written by a totally discredited author. Ronald Reagan had the same problem and handled it well, so will I. Kitty Pavlich, editor of townhall.com, Fox News contributor, Marion Marsh, former senior advisor to John Kerry. Ladies, good Monday to both of you. Good morning. And a happy new year. Good morning. We, we can still happy say that. Yes, um, I don't know what you thought about the Stephen Miller, Jake Tapper back and forth, but I don't know what you thought about this Newsweek headline either. Here's how it read. It came out over the weekend. Trump could destroy the entire human species, says Yale psychiatrist who warned Congress members. So, Katie, this actually happened. Mm -hmm. With some members of Congress, they, they, they were told that the commander in chief could destroy the human population. Well, um, the, <laughs> how far have we gone? Look, the Yale psychiatrist who is making this accusation has not evaluated uh, President Trump. The band of other psychiatrists they've uh, received to deem the president mentally unfit have not uh, evaluated President Trump. It is unethical. It is uh, a violation of all of the standards in the medical community, uh, and yet they think it's okay. Um, and it's actually dangerous from their perspective to be to be doing this. This, uh, you know, we've been through this before during the Barry Goldwater years when he was running for president in 1964. Uh, there was a rule written by the American Psychiatric Association banning and barring ethically all psychiatrists from evaluating candidates or or people in general on mental stability if they have not physically and individually evaluated them. So they violate their own ethics. It's dangerous. Uh, it's unethical. And it's beyond the pale for uh, them so to be doing wonder how, how dangerous it is for us overseas, too, Marianne. What, what do you think of what's going on in the back and forth in, in the media about the, um, the stability of President Trump? So I, I think what's fair here is Katie's got a great point. She's right. Diagnosis from afar isn't appropriate. But we now have two examples that we can look at. First and foremost, in this book, we ask which is up for debate, but many people who work with Donald Trump have expressed their concerns about his well-being. Secondly, we also have behavior by Trump who, who in that, words, deeds, and tweets. Who, who's worked for the president me, that expresses <laughs> concerns about his mental stability? You, you, you have many people in this book and no elsewhere. One. Give public, me a name. Who, who, well, well, Michael Wolf obviously didn't uh, name them, but he certainly pointed to Stephen Bannon as one recently and publicly. So we have that. And on the other hand, you also have Donald Trump's words and tweets and actions towards North Korea, where there are nuclear weapons involved. And I think that's a dangerous game because you now see our allies and others around the world increasingly concerned about Trump's behavior on this front with it's, his tweets, and especially a, with North Korea, around nuclear it's weapons. It's a dangerous game to play. And I, yeah. I, I really did not, I, I read a lot of the book over the weekend. I did not take that from that, but perhaps I have not gotten far enough in it. Ladies, we're going to bring you back because we're getting a little short on time here, given the breaking news. But this is a topic that from the left is not going to go away. So plenty of time to debate it. Thanks for coming on today. Katie yep. Marianne, thank Thanks, you. Phil. You sure. bet. Thanks. Sandra. The red carpet last night goes black at the Golden Globes as Hollywood stands in solidarity against sexual harassment. It's 2018. Marijuana is finally allowed and sexual harassment finally isn't. It's going to be a good... The red carpet went dark as Hollywood A-listers turn out in all black, raising awareness about sexual harassment. And joining me now is Carly Shimkus, reporter for Fox News Headlines 24-7. If I knew you any better, I would, I, I, I'm pretty sure you watched every minute of this. I did, yes. <laughs> it so, ends too late. That's so, my one complaint. So we kind of knew leading into this that, that, that most of the actresses were going to wear black. They did were. it end up that way? Yeah, almost every single actress did wear black. I think three did not. They must have not gotten the memo. Yikes. Uh, but the conversation was uh, completely, uh, it was really dominated in terms of uh, the sexual misconduct issues surrounding Hollywood right now. Seth Meyers, he hosted the show, he started things off talking about uh, the issue Issues. Of course, uh, actresses wore black, like you said. Oprah Winfrey, she won a Lifetime Achievement Award last night, and she uh, devoted her speech mm. to inspiring women as well. Very, very powerful one, yeah, right? Absolutely. For too long, women have not been heard or believed if they dared to speak their truth to the power of those men. But their time is up.
A very serious looking Angelina Jolie there at the end. So, so this is leading to a lot of speculation. Absolutely. A lot of speculation, or should I say calls for her to run for president in 2020. There's always that conversation when you talk about Oprah. Is she going to run for office? One of the most interesting tweets, though, came from NBC. Mm. They tweeted, nothing but respect for our future president. And they tweeted that with a picture of Oprah. So uh, okay. that was NBC, not NBC News, but still some calling that tweet, you know, a little questionable. All right. So the speculation is surely out there on that. So, But not a, not a lot of political mentions, not a lot of mentions of the president. You know, award show ratings have been down lately. Uh, Seth Meyers said in advance that he was probably going to go easy on the political jokes. You know, there were some here and there. Uh, not so much more jokes about the sexual misconduct issues, of course. Um, Natalie Portman said something pretty mm. interesting. She was a presenter for a Best Director, and 